Hey, Newsicast listeners, you can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Please help us grow by subscribing or sharing the Newsicast with friends or follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. Now, let's get this show on the road. It just can't be created everywhere because it takes a special kind of dynamic for this to come together. Because as I say, it, it takes a village to raise a music festival like this. And it's a community driven project that was developed to be here for the future. Welcome to the NoosaCast. What is a NoosaCast? It's where we bring local folk stories to life through conversation. Tash, this is the first time we just did, I think you and I were just talking before we hit record. This is one of the best interviews we've ever done. And you and I just literally, what we usually don't do this. We just walked in right into a new studio here and we're going to record the opening and we're just going to play the interview. We'll do our segments, but play the interview that you and I just sat down with, with, with Dave Willems and, and we talked we talked about Mile, but man, we talked about so much more, Tash. We talked about events. We talked about stuff. An idea that brews in your head and how you get that to spit out of your head and, and just morph into the community. We talked about it all. It felt like it's the first time I felt like Joe Rogan, to be honest with you, Tash. Yeah, you know, um, this podcast has sports. It's all about sports. But as we know in a community and as we know in, in a country and in the world, music and sports play this huge they, – they're combined. You know, you don't have walk-up songs without – without music you you don't have sports without music and vice versa i think a lot of it so um even though this isn't particularly about sports it's about uh it's about one of the biggest things in this community and that's the mile of music and you know i i I think back uh to growing up in this community and one of the things that we didn't have growing up joe was was live music and this community has become live Uh, music it, it has tosh and it's because of the mile of music we don't have that this this live music this vibe that that our community has without the mile of music um, that started in 2013. No, it's it's incredible. I mean, it, it it sets the vibe, it sets the feeling, it sets the the compass. I don't I don't know what the right word is for for just us for Appleton for for the Fox Cities. It's we 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 talk about it in in the interview. I mean, you, you know, like Austin has South by Southwest, and and Nashville has its thing, and and. Appleton can have its thing. It's it's not it's not those, but on a different level, on a different scale. You and I even talk about it with this podcast. We're not Joe Rogan. We're not professional at this, but at a very micro scale and, and shrink it down to the Fox Cities and local. That's that's what you and I are just doing with this podcast. That's our audience, and that's Milo Music is just. It's just absolutely incredible, and we should all embrace it as a community and and talk to Dave about that and just kind of just creating that vibe, man, that that's, it's really, it's, it's, it's becoming who we are. And it, it's so, so cool to, to hear about that and just understand how that whole dynamic works. You know, he, he brings this up in the interview, talks about how this isn't just a, an Appleton thing. This has become something that is well known. Uh, you know, they've had, they've had bands from Australia. They have bands from Europe uh, these past uh, couple of years, but um, just to show what kind of impact Milo Music has had. Um, I was talking to my brother before um, and my parents before uh, I we recorded and told him who we're interviewing tonight. And my brother said he was at a Publix down in Sarasota wearing a Milo Music shirt and somebody stopped him in Sarasota, Florida and said, I've been to that festival. It's awesome. You know, it's so it's, cool to hear. It's, uh, it has it has become a big, big thing. And I, we might take it for granted because it's right here in our community and we don't get to see the bigger impact. Uh, but this is a huge, huge festival. It's become a huge festival. Dave's going to tell us you know, a lot about the ins and outs of it and some of the difficulties moving forward and some of the cool things moving forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the other thing just, I guess maybe more selfishly, I, I love the talk that we had about 
just that the whole event as a whole and just the, the what an event is and just that experience creating that that experience that that, that creative act and and you know that's every bit a part of 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 anything that we do even a sporting event you, you know that that is an act and, and that, that we're enjoying and dave is yeah. creating and just a creative act and, and a musician every time they take the stage it's the same thing it's i don't know as humans i feel like that's something that we crave we, we crave you know we're talking about joe rogan i i coincidentally um i i was listening to an episode and he was specifically talking about music with his guests and and the gist of it was that music is a language that it's you know we're attracted to and it does whatever it does to us it makes us move in ways that we normally don't move and things like that there's something real there and they were they were trying to they ultimately couldn't quite explain it it's almost the unexplained other than we know it's there and and you know that's one of the reasons that i think mile is so successful is because it just we crave whatever that that is that music and that's that's Man, that, that's what we love. Yeah, you, you're right. Because 90% of the bands that come here, you've never heard of yeah. before. Even maybe more than that. Um, you, you've you never heard them, but you get into that groove and you get into that that vibe of people who are just, you know, enjoying the weekend. And you, you see these bands seeing people enjoying what they're doing and they're enjoying themselves even more. Yeah. And it just becomes this uh, this circular type of, of spiral of just good times, good uh, vibes. And I think, you know, that's, that's what, that's what this whole thing is. It's quite, it's unexplainable, but oh man, does that feel good? Doesn't it, Tash? It feels so, so good. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I mean, we could talk about a lot of this, but a lot of it is going to be talked about right, in the interview. Right, exactly. I, I, I think, you know, you're going to really enjoy listening to Dave and listen to the enthusiasm he has um, this passion project for him and even talks about how he started it and uh, you know, wh what he was doing when the thought came to him. Yeah. So uh, please sit down, enjoy this episode. Um, and, you know, again, if you have comments or you have some ideas, you know, shoot them to us, email us, uh, listen to wherever you get your podcast, check us out on YouTube. All of those things help this podcast continue a hundred percent and just if you have an extra dollar or two think about donating to to Milo music you, you know there's so many dave lays it out there's different packages and if you have a couple of extra bucks throw them our way too it's just it's local stuff we're just dave is we are just building the community throwing our little part in there to make this place a special place that it is so let's get on with the show tash i know right this is this is fun so, I mean, do you like me? Like, what's so, your favorite kind of music? What do you like? But it's cool to hear you say um, music and, you know, sports, you know, that kind of almost like music more than sports. When I know, of course, yeah. your background, Joe, and in and, and both, as you're both into sports. And, of course, I worked for the Packers back in the day when I was in college. So I, I grew up, uh, you know, within not too far from Lambeau Field, not, not in the shadow, because that would have been uh, closer over by Lambeau, but I grew up by West High School. And so I, I grew up. And, uh, you know, idolized and had a chance to meet some of the Packer players when I was a younger kid because my dad, you know, worked a, a second job for one of the one of the board of directors of the Packers at the time. And so every now and then he'd run into uh, a player or two while he was doing odds and ends at her house. And then he would bring me along if he knew you. So, well, that's how I met Bart Starr when I was like yeah. nine. <laughs> but then I ended up working for Bart when I worked for the Packers and for, for a couple of years in college. So sports and, and actually the, the whole concept behind Mile of Music, and I'll get back to your question on, on the music piece, but the whole concept behind Mile of Music came from a con, uh, from a walk that I had after leading a meeting in downtown Appleton with, the, with a bunch of the businesses who – we just basically had one challenge, and that was, can we come up with an, a, you know, an event that would put people in our businesses? And actually, that the meeting was about all kinds of stuff, and we did a, a SWOT analysis to talk about the, the strengths and the weaknesses of a downtown, and I did that for, for ADI. And um, in the course of the conversation, what came up was um, how strong the walkability was for downtown Appleton, which, of course, having been a downtown guy and work downtown and live near downtown i i always knew that and um and and in that conversation uh, uh, several of them had we had i think we had just come off of uh the big event in downtown appleton oktoberfest and and you know that's a little bit tricky for some of the businesses oktoberfest is 
saying, how can we come up with a business that puts people into our businesses, not out on the street? Yeah. And so and as I was walking back from the meeting, we had the meeting up in the leg lamp above the bar. As I walked back, um, I, I went past a couple of the sports bars and I, I thought, well, we could do a sports legends thing. We could put sports legends into the bars, you know, 15, 20 bars and have this really cool thing, uh, kind of like my experience was at, at years before at, at South by Southwest. And I thought, well, wait a minute, why would we do sports legends? Why wouldn't we just go ahead and do music? And and so, and, and, and could we do kind of a mini version of South by Southwest, maybe more like it was in its first five or 10 years. Yeah. And so that's kind of how the, 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 uh, the whole concept came about by the time I got back to the office, four or five block walk, six block walk. Um, I kind of had the idea gelled in my head and then it was like, is this really, is, is it just me or is this a good idea? And so I talked to a couple people at the office right away and they, before I even got the sentence out, they were like, we got to do this. And so that's kind of how it, how it evolved. And then I had to talk to my brother who was my business partner at the time and say, so I have this idea to do an event that we're probably going to spend a half million dollars of marketing agency time on, um, probably not going to make any money, um, but it's going to be really cool for downtown. Um, and he lives in Green Bay. So um, so I had that little hill to climb, right? Because he wasn't as vested in Apple than he is, he is and was. But, but, but um, and so he, um, um, I, you know, he immediately said, well, first, he, I think he said something like, so chances are, if I say no, you're probably still going to do it, right? <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, and I said probably, and he said no. He said I, I'm just kidding. He said I think this is a hell of an idea, and we should just go all forward because he said, you know, we're not getting any younger, and, and if we if we want to do something that can change the community and leave a legacy and stuff, we might as well it, something like this. And he said, geez, what's better? And he, you know, he's a he was a rock and roll guitarist in the '60s, was in a Beatles cover band up in Green Bay. <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, again, huge music fan, bigger music fan probably than I am. But, you know, not, I've always liked music. I, I, I've spent some time um, after college. I worked for a company in Milwaukee called GMR. We did music spon- We did sponsorships for music and comedy for Miller Brewing Company and a, a few other uh, companies uh, around the country and eventually around the world. And I was the PR director for that company. So that's when I went to South by Southwest. Actually, when I went to the second South by Southwest and the third South by Southwest. So that gives you an idea how old I am, but, um, you know, young at heart, right? That's the key. Um, I always do say I wish I'd kind of been in a position to start that started 10 years earlier. Of course, I was right in the middle. Like like a lot of our music fans, we always um, talk about the fact that, we, you know, our music fans tend to be, like younger and and, 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 and and single and then married in their 20s. And then all of a sudden, oh, along come kids. And then it's like, we'll probably lose them for 15 or 20 years. And then right. we're going to get them back. And then we have them back. And then we have them all the way into what I call the, I can still go out there yeah. the club era, <laughs> which, which is, uh, which is where many of our fans are now, you know, right. that many of the fans come to Gibson community music hall, you know, they're, they're tickled pink to be going out, and, they, and I had a guy tell me one. And I know I, I know you, you've only asked me one question. And I'm still sorry about that. Uh, I'm trying to make a living talking, so I apologize for that. I had a guy come to the uh, to a show one night, not at Gibson. This was years ago, so about five six years ago. It was I think we had a show at Outer Edge or something, and um, we were um, we were. Uh, he walked in and he goes, he just was beaming, and I said, I said, oh, I said, boy. I said, you look more more happy to be here than usual. And he said, I just, I'm just i just glowing, he said, because I left the house and my college daughter was home and she and her friends were playing a board game at the kitchen table. And I was walking out and it was 1030 and they said, where the heck are you going? And I said, I'm going out to see some live music. And I closed yes. the door behind me. Yes. <laughs> He said he kind of felt like he was turning the tables on him. And I said, well, that's that's one of the best stories I've heard. And it still is one of the best stories. Absolutely. Music is language. And I'm learning that. The old, you know, We talk about sports and all that. And I still love sports. But the older I get, the more music just speaks to everything about me. I just it's there's something different about it. And I think that's why Miles so successful. You said a ton there, and it's, it's it's funny that you tell the story about how Miles started, because it's literally the, the one question I wanted to ask you is, 
that that creative act that that idea that you have in your head when when that in that walk when when you just created mile in your head is that is that basically how you're usually creating your events your ideas do they come to you like that like that does it just pop in your head and it and you can it's almost a vision that you you just see it unfold you know what it is and then you spit it out of your head yeah i, I think um well and that's kind of how we've always done with the agency, the marketing firm. And then, you know, we've always been a marketing and an events firm, Willems Marketing Events. And we, we used to be just Willems Marketing. We changed to Willems Marketing Events when when Mile came along. But it really, we always did do a lot of events. And we always prided ourselves really about experiences. And so when people, going back to your other question about music and, and being a music fan and what type of music and so forth. And my answer to that by, would be, I, I do like all kinds of music. If I probably was on a, had to head to a desert island and have to choose one genre of music, it would probably be folk rock sure. slash rock. Um, you know, and, and uh, um, um, you know, the guitars, the drums, rock and roll, but probably not the heavy stuff, a little more toward the folk rock side of it. Singer, songwriter stuff for sure. Have you discovered the Grateful Dead? Uh, well, you know, it, it's interesting you bring them up because I haven't listened to a lot of Grateful Dead. Life changing. Um, I really haven't um, over the years. Not not on purpose. Um, I just it wasn't kind of a lane I went in. I kind of tended to go more in the lane of um, of, of Mellencamp back in the day. Uh, you know, Springsteen, uh, sure. certainly the Rolling Stones, but not not heavy Rolling Stones. I couldn't tell you probably more than fifteen Rolling Stone songs, but but I but I really enjoy them. I enjoy the bands that we've had at the Mile that have kind of emulated the Rolling Stones a little bit or have used them as their icons and so forth. And, and, and that's always a lot of fun. It's one of the reasons when we were doing tributes, we used to do uh, at the beginning of the mile, we used to do tributes yeah. for several years. Um, one of the, one of the sets of the entire festival, the only one that wasn't original was a tribute set. Usually we did a Tom Petty one year. You may remember yep. that we did a Rolling Stones one. We did a Prince, yep. uh, Oh, we won the year that the, 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 they both passed. We really liked that. All of these bands, all these original music performers, they, they you know, they're patterned after they, they started by listening to other artists. Um, and and they, many of them started as cover artists, obviously, and then eventually started to write their own music. But if we're truly going to be an original uh, festival, we have to be 100% original. So that's where... We're now kind of looking at, you know, with Gibson and under the umbrella now, and, and we've got that place exactly the way we wanted. It looks great. It sounds yeah. amazing. Well, so now we, there's just a lot of cool stuff we can start to do there. We'll start to do some tribute shows or some quasi tributes. But when we do tributes, it's always going to be not during the festival. The festival will always be 100% original. Um, when we get, because, you know, the artists all sign a pledge. When they show up at the PAC and they check in, and we have an artist check out space, which we do, and they get all their stuff and they get their packet and they get their check, which covers all their sets for the weekend and so forth. They get wow, paid nice. ahead of time. We tried, just I tried the first year to pay them at the end okay. of the festival. It was a nightmare because <laughs> you had to corral them all. Sure. You had to track them all down. You, had, you know what I mean? We had several artists, two or three, I think, that left town without getting paid. Yeah. And we felt awful. You know, so we... We said, you know, we reached out to them. They were literally on the road. And we said, okay, that, we're never doing it that way again. And so then we just felt, you know, but, but we also got to know the artists that first year. That that was the first fest we had done. And we said, you know what? These are really, yeah. really cool people. Um, part we underestimated was just how great some of these humans are. And so we said, you know what? We can trust them. And so by year two, right away, we were already giving them their checks when they showed up. And uh, and that's never been a problem, obviously. And for, um but when they check in, there's also a form that, that basically says this is an original music festival, which means we want you to express your original aspect of being an artist. And we want you to only play your original music. And you are not we are pledging here to only play your original music. Every year we have a couple, three that somehow sneak in a, a cover. And oftentimes they get shouted <laughs> down by the crowd, which is kind of, they always go away. I shouted down. I started. To, I started to talk about playing the cover, and they went, "No way!" You know that kind of thing. And then uh, there were a couple of years ago, we had a couple artists that both, for whatever reason, both played Ohio, the the, the protest song, um, you know, and did amazing versions of them. But, but right. that's not what we're about. And so we had to 
out to them after the fest and just say, we love you. Um, it's not a penalty. We're not going to not have you back because of it, but you just got to understand that when we say no covers, no matter whether you performed it yourself or not on your latest album or whatever, uh, we mean no covers and stuff. And so, but anyway, I'm getting out, 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 again, oh, I love that a tangent, but we have really focused on that piece. But so I, so I worked for that, that company that, that we did some neat stuff around and I went to that, that South by Southwest and I saw how kind of the, at that point, it was really a music conference. It was it was mostly the daytime stuff, and then they had what they called showcases, and they called them showcases, which I think was probably where it really started to 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 to, to circulate as as a name. They called them showcases because I think they had two different lengths. It was maybe twenty five and fifty, or or twenty and forty, or whatever it was. It might have been a half hour and sixty minutes, and. Based upon where you were at in the music industry, based upon because these were almost all unknown, and what they did is they said to ind- independent artists and in indie, indie musicians, "Come to Austin. We'll get record executives there. You'll have record executives, agents. We're going to have a conference during the day with all these people, and then at night we're going to have showcases, and they're going to be there watching your show. And by the way, come and I think I believe this is true." Come and play yeah. for free. Make your way to Austin. Figure out a way to get here, and we're going to have the sure. right people watching you. And so that's how South by Southwest came about. So when I went there, it was second year, the third year. We had a little ten by ten booth. It was for Miller Genuine Draft. We had a Miller Genuine Draft band networking. So we had bands from around the country that were popular in their own markets. And so they, they were performing, uh, they were, we had this network that went around the country. And so we, we uh, helped work with the distributors and advanced the shows and gave the bands promotion and stuff. And it was a cool program. And um, I was the PR guy. So I was calling all the music critics around the country back then, believe it or not, everybody sure. had a music writer. I mean, everybody. It was a pretty cool, a pretty cool deal, pretty cool gig. Um, and, uh, but it was, gave me a chance to see South by Southwest. And so, all those years later, because that would have been 13, 26 years later after, again, raising kids and all that stuff. Now I'm in a position where I could say as I'm walking back, we could make that work. We could make that happen. And uh, we have the downtown for it. Fortunately, I had worked so much with downtown. I had done a number of events in downtown. I started to do music. I had done a couple of charity shows with Corey uh, Chisel, and, and, and we had had that. And so I, I could see from the marketplace that that Appleton was ready for the experience and for experiences. And I had worked on the book festival as an agency. We had helped the book festival doing pro bono work. Um, as an agency, we always tried to give about 25 to 50% back of whatever we did every year. We did all of the, and continue to do ADI work for a significant discount. Is that just, that was a way for us not being a lucrative industry, not being where I'm raking in the dollars as a business. It was a way for us to, uh, while we went along as a business, to also give back to the community. So we would do some cash and we'd do some in kind. And so we really had a neat opportunity with with thinking back as I walked back. I thought, you know, this is, this is something we can do. And it was really, a, it, it's really about the experience. And, and for me, when people ask me, are you a big music fan? I get that asked a lot at Gibson as people are walking out the door because they come over to compliment on how things look. By the way, the number one, again, tangent, the number one comment we get is how nice our restrooms are. Yes, yes. <laughs> hey, what is well, that room upstairs? It's just beautiful from the avenue. Yeah, that, and the folks who own the building, they own they own the building and they live upstairs. And, and they wow. have built really cool space upstairs. It runs from front all the way to back. Uh, we get a fair amount of people come in and ask how they can get upstairs. They were trying yeah. to walk me. We always joke with them and say, well, yeah, you just go. And then we stop and say, no, no, it's, it's a private residence. Yeah. So <laughs> but, uh, I told Lisa uh, recently, I said, yeah, we're going to start sending people up there, you know. Um, so, but um, it's a cool, yeah, they have a, it's a cool space. Um, uh, and they're very beautiful. big downtown proponents. Okay. They're big advocates downtown and she uh she she's on the app the downtown incorporated board and stuff so you know we're lucky you know that quite frankly uh, folks like ben and lisa but but other folks too um before them those are the reasons why we created uh the festivals because i knew um having been entrenched in the community for so many years having having seen it from all different angles and i always said back in the day when we get interviewed for different things i would say um what's when there's an opportunity you can get people to come to the table the business community the nonprofit yeah. community the, the municipalities and so we're very fortunate very lucky and so it, it takes a special kind of community now i'll tell you this the artists have already recognized that they know that this as much as 
people hope or think that it could be communi- it could be created in other areas around the country. It can't be created everywhere. It could be created in other parts of the country. It just can't be created everywhere because it takes a special kind of dynamic for this to come together. Because as I say, it, it takes a village to raise a music festival like this. And when we sat down after the Rolling Stone article a year ago in September when that yeah. article hit, and all the media wanted to do interviews, and I, I, I said to the team, I said, I'm going to sit, we need to sit down and think about how many pairs of hands actually go into creating this festival every year? And it's about 3,000 pairs of hands or more. It's a, it's, a, it's a festival in and of itself that kind of makes the festival happen. And that's, that's probably the part that we're most excited about and most proud about is the fact that so many people have embraced it. They've, they've, they understand it. Um, we know that, as it turns out, that this is just something we initiated. But in reality if we're all lucky enough and we all work hard and quite frankly if we have a successful couple of years here of fundraising through the new nonprofit that's been established if we can get all that done it'll be around for a long long time and it'll be our version of a much different event but our version and in, in, in my mind just um and happy to say it publicly a better event uh, than say a summer fest or some of those mm-hmm. I'm not trying to say that to make to create controversy. I'm just saying from the standpoint of genuineness and authenticity and what it means to the to the to this smaller uh, community. Um, I think it, uh, from a brand perspective, I think this has helped. It's become a brand that Appleton can hang its hat on and be proud about. And when I have folks approach me. Uh, like I did at the at the intersection a, a couple of years ago, uh, at, right by the city center, and a couple of our regular music fans were on their bikes, and they had a couple of people behind them. Um, and if I remember correctly, there were a couple of little little people attached to those bikes, and they said, "Hey, Dave, this is this this is my this is our daughter and her husband and my grandkids, and they've they they just moved back to Appleton and." They said one of the reasons they moved back to Appleton was Mile of Music, and and, and their comment was that Appleton Appleton is cool now, and uh, and uh, um, obviously that makes you feel as good as anything could when you just saw how beaming they were with the fact that they were out on a bike ride with their kids and their grandkids, and so that stuff happens all the time. I'm I'm, I'm happy to report and humbled to report wow. that people approach me all the time at Gibson, about six of them the other night, and just want to talk about how proud it makes them feel when these artists come to Appleton. 700 musicians last year, uh, 1,200 uh, acts, um, different bands, solo duo trios, bands have come to Appleton over the first 10 years of the festival, 1,200, including wow including um, um, about a, about 70 or 60 or so, 80 maybe, uh, music education presenters. So between the artists and the music education presenters, that's 1,200. And um, we're actually coming out with a poster soon. It's going to be a large 30-inch wide by 45-inch tall uh, poster that'll be the first 10 years. It's basically 10 miles of good vibes. And it's <laughs> going to have all... Um, all 1200 artists listed on it. Um, wow. and so, um, it's, it's going to be pretty cool. And, and that'll be a souvenir poster that people will be able to purchase. Um, and we're just going to print them as people purchase them because, you know, it's a larger than the average poster. Yeah, uh, sure. And, but, it, but putting that together and, and seeing the names on it and it just was, it was pretty exciting to see and we're, we're really happy, but it, it comes back to the experiences and that's what I'm about is I, I, I really enjoy, and it doesn't have to be always behind the scenes. I'm happy to get out there in front on the stage and those types of things. I don't have a issue with that at all. And I feel like many of us who helped to create the festival are part of this. And so they, they should get out in front and so forth. Not everybody likes doing it, but, um, but the reality is it, it, it really is about creating and what I really like is creating experiences. And I love seeing people enjoy those experiences, a little bit of that kind of, um, yeah. a little bit of that magic of, of creating stuff that people get excited about. Dave, you know, some of the few people like, like, uh, you know, Steve job, Walt Disney, Elon Musk. I mean, all of those guys are about, the experience before we ever knew we needed an iPhone, Steve jobs knew we needed an iPhone, that experience. And that's exactly what you're doing. And it's, it shows that's why it's, I love being from Appleton because of Milo music. It's, it's no different than being from Austin in the South by Southwest. You know, it's those big, you, you feel connected to, you know, to, to those festivals. I mean, I, I take that week off every, every year for, for work. It's just 
it's in the books. I'm, I'm, I'm off because it's, it's just what we are. And Appleton is, is that one of the things I love about Miles so much is it's how it's stitched into the community, but it's, it's where the events take place, where you have the stages located. I mean, they're, they're morphed into Lawrence, they're morphed into alleys, they're morphed into these corners and that corner. And the indoor venues are great, but I absolutely love the, the, the creativity of the outdoor venues. They're just fantastic. Yeah, I think the the mantra there is just simply, and there are there are a couple of festivals. I, I don't, I haven't been to them. I don't know them by by very well, but I know that in talking to some of our artists locally and other folks early on in the festival, Corey provided a lot of input, um, you know, to to some of the ideas of things he had seen that he liked and didn't like, and he always would say, um, "Let's, you know, if we can treat the artists." Because my comment was uh, to him, I remember early on in the process where we had a team that, that we put together that helped. Gene Dachin was one of those um, uh, other folks. And then, uh, you know, in the early going, we had volunteers that stepped forward to book that first festival. Kurt Kempen stepped forward as a volunteer, eventually became a contracted pl- person and then an employee. Um, it, you know, as, as, as the initial booker of the festival, um, the... But, but we all pitched in and did different aspects of that. But, what, you know, I remember Corey saying, if, if well, I, I mentioned to him, I said, so we're not on the way to anything unless you like football. You know, we're not on the way to anything really. So how do we get people to get up here to Appleton? How do we make this happen? We were just brainstorming. And one of the comments he made during that process was, I can tell within the first hour or two of going to a, fe- I think he said it, going to a festival or going to a venue, whether I ever going to want to go back again. I can tell right away how I'm treated, how the people are, how the owner is, how the manager is, how the, how the, the, the stage hands are. He said, I can tell right away whether I want to go back or whether I need to go back. And, and so he said, if we, tre- I th- he said, if we come up with a way to treat the artist extra special, he said, that'll help. And we're like, we're, you know, taking notes. And then we were brainstorming and it didn't take us long to think about the fact that we need to treat the artists. It, it's strategic. It's also how we all want to do it. We all, we all want to be good people and we want to make, we know that this can be an oasis. This can be a Shangri-La and an oasis for artists. It's proven to be that. So when you mentioned, so we put the artist care program together, we did all the rest of the stuff. Artists have been paid from day one. Um, we've been gradually being able to pay them more, but more importantly, we put this amazing artist uh, care program together with the dental care and the hearing care and the the melanoma screenings and all those types of things. We've caught we've caught two melanomas over the years. Uh, both artists said we've saved their lives because they would have never gone in. They were in their early thirties or mid thirties and would never have gone in and 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 stuff. And whether whether we did or didn't, the idea that we we helped them out is is huge. And so that artist care program is one of the reasons Rolling Stone wrote that article and talked about how Appleton is doing it right. And, and that's a, that's a tremendous endorsement for us all. And we should all feel proud about that. And, and that's, I, I, you know, I've always been kind of more of a, you know, let's, let's do this together. It, 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 and we needed it to be done together. It's uh, one, you know, so as, as we've gone through it, it's, it's just been really cool to see it evolve um, in many ways, the way we had thought it could and would, but obviously we didn't necessarily assume when we started this thing that it was going to be this, you know, this this thing that was going to be as popular as it is. Now we have to make. Now that we've been through a decade, we've put everything we bring in, we put it back into the festival. Every year, there's new hiccups. There's things that get in the way of us getting to the next level of financials. So we need to spend the next uh, three or four years, but really the next second decade has to be about solidifying it financially it has to come up with a different type of financial model we have to be better at sustaining it we have to get more people to give a little bit uh, more people to give more than a little bit um, the folks that want to see it continue um, because um, in order for it to stick around and stay as a in my mind now somebody else may come in there may be as we evolve the nonprofit maybe the board of directors that's that that that's that says we want to do it differently i don't think so i think right now everybody wants to continue to have it be this free and accessible festival um the minute you start charging something for a wristband for the week now you change expectations completely now you joe as a fan 
coming to it now. Um, right now, you might, after going to three venues at seven o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night, not be able to get in, right? So you go to your fourth one, and now you go online and you might you social, you might say share with a friend, "Hey, there's there's so many people downtown. It's awesome." And I just had to go to my fourth venue before I could get in. And guess what? I went in and saw this band at the Bent Keg, and they were better than the band I was planning to go to see. Right? That's how you do it, and you're excited about it. But now, once you've paid. 25 bucks for the weekend wristband or 50 bucks or 500 bucks. Like some of these, play, you know, these festivals charge. And I'm just using one example here of, of the expectations changing. Now, when you go to that fourth venue and you still can't get in, what does your social post end up looking like now? It's like, right. Hey, I paid for this darn thing. And I just went to four venues and I couldn't get into any of, you know, so right away it starts to shift. Right. And so, sure. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is it changes our conversation with our agents and our, and our, and our artists and so forth, because it's no longer a free community festival, which it is now. And the third thing is for those venues who think that that's a good idea or whatever. Well, once they start having 50 people in their venue at nine o'clock at night, not 150 or 200, uh, because now you're making a choice as someone who's paid to come, you're now deciding where you're going to go a little bit more closely right and so it would change the dynamic significantly and so um i think that's something we will look at every year because ultimately in bottom line we have to have a financial uh, a stronger financial model but i don't know that that's the answer i'd like the answer to be getting to more and more people more and more companies to say we like it the way it is we like how authentic it is we like the fact that people around the world and this is true musicians and fans around the world talk about Appleton because they've pulled off something that's unique in the sense that they have this incredible multi-venue festival indoor and outdoor when it rains we still have a festival it's, yeah. it's happened a little bit it some of the bounces out of the step but we still have a pretty amazing festival with 20 venues operating at the same time with live music um, but the reality is we you know we want them to also feel like um, like what's unique about this thing is that everybody can get to it and, and it, and it's, and it's accessible and it's free and it's original. I think right. the bottom line is it all in my the original and I, that's not any slam against any musician who's not an original musician. I think they're talented. I think they're great. I remember having a couple of the cover bands say to me, uh, they weren't real happy with me after the second or third year. Cause you know, we, and I said, I think this is going to bring everybody up in terms of, I think you're going to have more gigs than you've ever had before. I think it's because everybody's going to be thinking about music. And about a couple of years later, one of them came up to me and said, we've, we've had more gigs than we've ever had. We're enjoying this more than we ever. People seem to be in tune more than that's a pun than they ever were. <laughs> so um, I think it has helped that way as well. And I'm, I'm glad about that because it was never started to be punitive, but it was just, you have to stand for something. And what we stood for was the idea that we were going to bring in singer songwriters who created songs to have a festival. Dave, um, going back to that first year and thinking about the bands that you wanted to come or trying to get a hold of bands to come to Appleton for this first festival, how was, how did that take place? Yeah. Yeah. We may, and we may have talked about this before. I know I certainly have talked to a number of people about it, but um we've always said and it's true that first year um putting the festival together um you know, we had a lot of you know local and state and in in regional bands that we brought in and, and they were you know accessible because you know kurt who was booking knew them from having done a couple of events that he had done previous where he was able to make actually had them in his phone and stuff like that but um anybody that we tried to reach to outside the state uh, there were a handful that we had to you know, enlist Corey for his help um, to basically just, you know, uh, say, hey, try so and so and so and so because I know them. Or maybe his agent at the time, his booking agent, knew some artists and we were able to reach through his booking agent because we had to go to people that we knew that were willing to give us a chance and come here. We did get a handful of others, but it was pretty tough sledding that first year to get anybody to call us back. Booking agents wouldn't call us back because, you know, you get this. I mean, I see it all the time at Gibson. I see stuff come in. I see names come in. Um, we get things into our Gibson email from artists, right? And, and some of them have very unusual names for the bands or the individuals or whatever. And you look at it and you go, um, is this legitimate? Is it not legitimate? So at the time, I, I you know, and I, we were talking about it as a group and we said, well, it kind of makes sense because 
here you are reaching out to a booking agent who books and then you're saying you're a mile of music. And it's like, well, what the heck is that? You know, and all of a sudden it's come out of nowhere. Right. Um, and it's like, we're going to do this festival and we're gonna, we want you to come and play it. And we can't pay a lot of money, but we're going to treat you really well. Uh, you're going to have a great experience. The town's going to embrace you. That's our, that's our bet. Um, blah, blah, blah. So come and give us a try. So um, first year to answer your question um, that, didn't fly all that great <laughs> you know it, it wasn't bad but it wasn't yeah. you know, it, it, we didn't have a a lot of penetration um by year two it was already not even an issue and by year three yeah. we were getting we were taking phone calls and agents were reaching out to us and saying take we have our whole lineup we have 26 artists can you would you like them all you know that kind of wow. thing it was and it was because the artists that came back and went back um, were literally texting in their cars on the way back saying, uh, hopefully they weren't driving, but they were texting in their cars on the way back saying, um, this thing was great. It was, we feel validated. We feel like this is the reason we started to play music. Um, they were giving the Jamie Kent message of famous and Appleton, right? With the yep. song created. And so that, that really, really took hold by uh, like year four and five. And, and um, I always said to the, to mayor Hannah at the time, and say it to Mayor Woodford too, but I said to Mayor Hannah, um, this has been a cool thing for me to see and I can relay it to you because um, we'd have a meeting every year like I do with Jake now too, but Tim and I would get together and we'd just talk about the year, how it went, talk about next year, anything different that we're going to be doing, anything different we might need from the city, anything we got to work on together because we don't just get stuff that we all have to work together on this and they have to agree to it. Um, and, uh, and we would basically walk through and I, you know, it was just, it was a, it was a neat process. And I would always say to him, here's what I'm hearing down from Nashville, um, which would be what I call, um, I call that Appleton South. You know, some people talk, <laughs> we were Nashville North, but I actually call Nashville Appleton South um, because, <laughs> A lot of our artists are in Nashville and they talk about Appleton when they're in Nashville um, and they do it all the time. They have better chances to play meaningful shows in my mind up here in Appleton or as yep. good chances as they do down there. Um, and, and so they, I said, it's, 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 it's progressed from being the very first, Hey, there was this festival up in, in this town in Wisconsin I uh, forget the name of the town, if you the name of the festival, but it was, it, I heard about it and it was apparently pretty good last year. And then it went to, have you played, um, uh, you know, uh, was that festival in Wisconsin? Then it went to, have you played Mile of Music? And then it went to, have you played Appleton? And that's where it's at now is the artists talk about, have you played Appleton? Whether it's one of the venues that's doing music year round, whether it's one of our special mile shows, whether it's the festival itself, um, they talk about it all the time. And I remember Adrian and Meredith telling me that when they were at a coffee house in Nashville, the artists at the like three tables over who they had not met yet uh, was starting to talk about um Appleton, Wisconsin, or they were talking about Appleton, Wisconsin, I'm sorry. And an artist came over from like four tables over and said, said, I played Appleton last year. Um, it, you know, I'm so-and-so. And then they got to know each other. And then another artist came over and said, are you guys talking about Appleton? They said, yeah. And he, and he said, he said, I haven't played there yet. T tell me about it. Well, <laughs> that's pretty special. That's pretty cool. And that's, I was going to say to you before, Joe, that's the opportunity we have in front of us is we have an opportunity when you, when you referenced Austin, you referenced Nashville. So you're exactly right. We have a, we have an opportunity. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I, was, I was referencing this to the convention and business bureau the other day. We have an opportunity right now for Appleton to be, and for mile to be mile 365 as an opportunity to be around all year round because mm -hmm. we connect music fans to the 1200 artists that have played the festival and we're working on that right now. There will be a conduit for them to have that connection at some point. I love that you said that was actually one of my questions was I was going to phrase it. Is Appleton turning into a Nashville? And, and I mean, we, you touched on that. So that, that really is happening, right? I mean, this is an extension of Nashville. Are the artists, I mean, are they coming up here at all? Is there visions of them recording and collabing together and, and actually maybe even living in Appleton um, and, and, and easily commuting between the, the, the two places and then having places like gibson hall and and you know things like that to actually play gigs yeah what so it's so i think uh, just a slight modification to that would be um just and i'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail because i don't want 
I don't want Nashville to feel like I'm going after him or something because I'm not. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, there's, I get there, that. There's areas in Nashville, East Nashville, other areas in Nashville that are evolving and bubbling up to be these really cool spots. And it's where the original music artists get to hang and do stuff. The original music artists don't have as much opportunity in Nashville unless you get to a certain level, right? So yeah. um, it's you're, you're basically playing, for, for what I saw when I was there, the couple of times I've been there, it, it, you're playing on Broadway, you're playing cover stuff, you're playing for tips, you're doing that. This is a, so one of the reasons they love coming here is because they can bring some of the ideas from these coffee shops in, in these other burgs around Nashville. They can bring the writer's rounds, they can bring the in the rounds, they can bring the, the song swaps to Appleton and we love it and people love it. And so um, it, 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 it really would be about um, it, it's going to sound kind of goofy and maybe a little egotistical and so forth on behalf of the community. But I think Appleton just needs to be Appleton in the music scene and it's already evolved. And so these artists are coming here saying, you guys have no idea what's in, what you've created here and how, and already now, are we 365? Are we everywhere? Are we, do we have 40 venues? Do we have to No. do we have, but I always have said, if you have five or six quality venues and they're doing it right and they're doing it with the right motivation and they're doing it passion first, maybe money second, um, this will be around for a long time, but it'll become unique and distinctive and very different from Nashville, very different from Austin. Uh, it, we're probably a little more like Austin than we are like Nashville, but the artists tend to come from Nashville because a lot of the artists moved from Austin to Nashville, got squeezed out by the tech industry, making things so expensive down in Austin in that area. Some of that same stuff is happening in Nashville. I don't necessarily see them necessarily moving to, I think we're going to become like, you know, how everybody goes down south during the winter time. Um, and um, and I think we're going to become, it's going to go the other way. They're going to come up here during the summer and the fall and maybe even the winter. We always joke with the artists when they talk about moving to Appleton. We say, we would love to have you. It's a great thought, but let, come up here for three weeks in January 1st and then decide. <laughs> You can stay at the band department or the band condo, hang here, play a couple shows, but see if you if you think you want. So I think you're on the right track. They're going to use us as a second home. This is going to yeah. be, this will become there, uh, and, and it's already happening. It's absolutely happening. And the community, if it wants to, can decide to make it a strategic thing. Uh, if they want to hang their hat on and they want to hang their fedora on, music that's mm -hmm. that's going to be ultimately their the decision but we have a long way to go i would say if, if we're talking about a one and i'm not mean long way to go bad i mean we have a long we have a lot of things we could do that are going to be amazing and going to be really cool and great on the journey to doing that I, the beauty of it is there's no pressure to have to be this or to have to be that the pressure is just to be who we've been already and to just keep doing it, but find new ways to do it. Um, and and uh, we can, uh, as I say at Gibson all the time to the team, we can have the bellwether out of Sheboygan yep. play five times a year at Gibson or six times a year at Gibson. The shows just have to be a little different each time. And if yeah. they're different, Time, people will love it. We can have Jamie Kent, Matt Slahetka, um, Dan Rodriguez. They can come back four or five. So they may not want to come back all those times because they're thinking <laughs> careers in a certain way right they would love to come back but but they're thinking if i if i come back that many times then my shows are gonna people are gonna get sick of me whatever, whatever it might be right but that doesn't have to happen because we can have them back in different ways dan and jamie are coming this week to host the avenue rate a uh, christmas show um you know um they're in and we're gonna do the after party at gibson with that which was a blast last year they can come back and jamie can come back in february and host the thing we're talking about doing some stuff february march maybe april of you know kind of this really cool singer songwriter festival mini fest kind of thing he can come back and host that right so now there's different ways for them to come back but be part of the fabric and that will happen and they, and they want it to happen and i think in some cases if you think about it really even a little differently than that there'll be a time in here where some of these artists, they were not going to be out there producing um, on tour all the time, but what they're going to be doing is they're going to still be making records, maybe make writing songs at home. They're still going to be, maybe they're not as visible on tour, but now all of a sudden they can say, guess what? My second home is Appleton. I don't really tour anymore, 
Um, but I can go up to Appleton and I'll play three gigs during the course of the year and just get that rush that comes with that, get that validation of being a creative artist and do it right and make a little bit of money, but really have this great connection to Appleton. And I think one of the parts I'm most proud about with the festival and how it's evolved is I, I call it the, the Houdini fountain phenomenon. And that's that, um, we're different. Uh, we're a festival of artists that you maybe don't know, but you should. Um, and we want it to be that way. I think we will always want it to now. We, we know that our niche and our niche, uh, for those who pronounce that word both ways, I always throw it in. <laughs> um, I never know. I don't want to exclude anybody. Um, so, um, but that is really to focus on um, artists that you that you don't know or you should or you may not know you should or what I call that are not household names but should be um, because they're that talented to focus on them because they're the artists that absolutely want to come to Appleton they know that we're going to treat them well and so forth and we can afford them and they can afford to come and, and, and spend time with us and so we're starting to evolve it where artists are coming here for a week and staying at the band department or the band condo and they're playing two or three shows and they're doing interviews at the Avenue radio and they're doing maybe going into a school and doing some stuff with one of the choirs. That's how we start to evolve it. But they will want to come back here. And the phenomenon with the fountain is I remember back year five or six, it was the vagabonds. It wasn't Daniel, the lead guy, but it was all the rest of the band. And I was walking and I saw them standing at the, at the fountain and, and, and they were watching the show at Houdini. And then a, a, two or three fans came by two or three gals came by and they were like, Hey, we just saw you guys at Jones park. You guys or wherever it was, you guys were amazing. It was awesome. We're coming to your next show, which is at spats, you know, and, and, and the band started talking to them and I went and had to do something else. I came back. It was 40 minutes later. I came back and they were still standing there talking <laughs> and not for like 11 people standing around them, all listening and all talking. Um, and I remember them sharing, um, it was maybe the next time they came and played, they played six sets when they were here. They played a different set for all six sets wow. because yeah. they had diff they had the same, they had like a hundred fans. They said that kept going to all the shows and they felt <laughs> they needed a different set because they had so many people going to every show. That's, that's just magical. Absolutely. Those are my favorite bands, Dave. I mean, you know, favorite band is fish and that's exactly what they do they they play a different set every night but one of the bands that i discovered at mile a couple of years ago and i would so love to see play three four five nights at Gibson, but kendall street they're, they're a jam band i just so love those guys i still follow them on, on social media and they're just uh they're just one of those bands that would just they, they, they would play a different set every night i know they would well that's interesting because so here's an example how many people have i talked to hundreds, maybe thousands between the festival, between Gibson, between the other mile shows we do, between just being a downtown guy. I, I spend a lot of time downtown. It It's really probably my home uh, more than my home is. My wife would probably tell you that. And she's okay with that, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, I talk a lot. So she's perfectly fine with that. She's like, you just come home for a couple hours and that's good. But um, I spend a lot of time downtown at different spaces. And so people come and talk to me. We've had 1,200 artists play the festival, so I've probably had people mention 300 artists to me, right, out of 1,200. Yeah. It feels like they've mentioned every artist to me that they could have mentioned, but they haven't, and they haven't even come close. Yeah. We have so many artists that have played the festival, and they've and they're, and they're, the talent is so deep. And, um, um, you know, I, I sometimes use the baseball analogy, and we're talking to two sports guys, too, as well as music guys, but there's double A, there's single A, double A. Sure. Two, single A, double A, triple A, you know, rookie league, you know, all that sort of stuff. And there's major leagues. So if, if, if we're bringing in artists that are at the single A and double A levels, right. Um, you think back to baseball and you see them play for the Timber Rattlers or wherever, and you're going, boy, they're really, really good. And then you see the level of major leagues and they're really, really, really good. But oftentimes there's not that much difference between no. them um, and it's really just seasoning. It, it's maybe a couple more years of experience. It's, it's, it's seeing certain situations and so forth. Um, not unlike the music world, to be honest with you. And, and I think, uh, I think the bigger thing that happens there is on the sports side of it, you're chasing something specific and you can, you can kind of get, you get kind of graded as you go. So you know, whether you're yeah. going to have 
about or not, right? It, it's know? the exact same thing. I totally agree with that. But reality. in music, you, the challenge with music is you don't really get you don't really get that same grading process. You don't really you, it, it's such a random thing whether you're going to take off or get found or you know, and, and and it's so. I think at a certain point they have to say, you know what, I got to do this to make a living, and I still want to do my music, and so right. we have a lot of those artists, and that. That's unfortunate. You know, I'd love to see a situation where we were able to put a, find find some of the deep pockets in the country, put a bunch of money into a pot, and say we're going to fund these artists to do what they're going to do, and let's create a hundred Appletons around the country uh-huh. that that these artists all of a sudden now have a chance to just do that, and that becomes their career. Can you imagine how special that would be, and how these artists would find that to be the most amazing thing ever? And then you think, what kind of material what type of content what type of life-changing stuff would these artists come up with if they could do that at that level and not worry about being incredible not worry about this level of success or being taylor swift or being whomever right Mm -hmm. they can be themselves but be able to make a living at it it would be it would be game-changing for the arts community within the whole country because like you said you started off the whole podcast by saying music creates music creates environment it inspires it creates communities language and, um yeah it's language and and if we could do that it would be pretty special well that's kind of our mantra here in appleton we've decided we can do that here in appleton so dave um we talked about the first few years and how it was a little bit more difficult to get bands how difficult is it to choose who's playing in these venues now it's almost impossible i mean we knew about four years ago you could see that the head storm coming you could see the um uh the challenges ahead in the sense that we feel really it's really hard because we know that we have to say no more than and yes um just just run the numbers if we have 225 let's say let's say if we have 200 or 250 artists at mile 11 and 125 of them are going to be returning and 125 are going to be new so now we've had 1200 play the festival and we're only bringing 125 back that's 10 percent yeah so we're saying no to 90 percent well now they're not all out there still doing their thing but most of them are um it's it 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 the best word i can say is and we've talked about it between the team whether it's ian who does the bulk of the booking or uh, Melissa on the team or Kim, my daughter who works for the company and does all the marketing and the, in the social and sees the comments from the communities of, and the, and from the band, she's the first one to see all that stuff. Um, and it sucks. That's the word we use is because we kind of created our own little worst enemy here in the sense that we can't possibly. So one of the things we can do is start doing more stuff. We can start, have them come back and play Appleton. They can play Gibson. They can play beer factory. They play um other shows that we're doing they can play stone arch um we're you know we're evolving some pretty cool spaces they come back and they play ledgestone during the summer they play it yeah. a little um there's there's some great spots for them to to play and that that's only going to continue to evolve and get a little bit better and, and so forth um as long as everybody's doing it right and and treating them right and treating them well um we're going to continue to be this magical place when we come back. But it, but really the idea is, is to get them to understand that, um, you know, we're doing our best and, and it's just, it's going to be really, really tricky um, to, uh, to, to make it happen. Um, there's no formula. We can't, somebody asked me the other night, they said, so is the formula, they were kind of look, thinking it through. And I, I'm guessing things start to spread. just like the telephone game. You hear one thing and then all of a sudden, and they said, so it's a formula that you can play two years and then you can't play a, You can't play three years in a row. And I said, I'd like to tell you that we strategically sat down and came up with this amazing formula that says you can only play two years and can't play a third year in a row. But no, that, that the, the numbers don't support that. They really, there's no way to even pledge to anyone that they can play more than one year, right? Because it's so it's a long answer to your question, but the reality is it's a it's a really good problem to have it's a really good position for the festival to be in but it also isn't uh, one that makes you feel good because you know that so many of these great people that i just referred to earlier as amazing humans that you can't have them back every year and you can't even sometimes have them back every second year or every third year so you had a band this year from Madison that played called the mascot theory that hadn't played the festival i think in four or five years and 
Um, it wasn't, and there was a year in there or two in there where they couldn't play it because they were somebody was one of the band members was out of town. But ultimately, you, we're going long stretches, and you feel bad about that. Um, but um, we're, we'll just keep doing the best we can. The good news about that is, you know, we, you know, we communicate, we try to let everybody know um, that our tough situation. I think we're going to be a little more just out front about that. Um, we, we're doing the artist submittal process in the next week or so, and we're really going to just welcome people to submit to play Appleton, not just the festival, yeah. but come and play Appleton and we'll share your information with, and we'll review these things and we'll have, uh, cause people, um, they're just excited about coming here cause they've heard such great things about, about the audiences and i should have said that earlier but what's made it different is the audiences and the audiences not every show is a listening room not every show is a whatever but what it is is every show is a respect show um only the music fans who have no idea what we're doing are the ones that aren't following the the norm of you know i always say it's you if we're doing a listening room that's obvious it's a listening room and we will tell you that be quiet we'll tap you on the shoulder and and or we'll we'll walk back back and forth with you with the sign that says quiet please or listening room and if we walk past you six times it means it's you you know um (laughs) means it's you Uh, and uh we've had it we've had that happen where it's like yeah well he keeps walking by with that thing oh wait a minute (laughs) um and we kind of you know nod the head like it's you um but um but none of the shows that way. Some shows are completely the opposite where they're just rocking and everything else. And it's fun and you can talk and you can do it. And then there's the ones in the middle where it's like, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're in the middle of the room, um, I remember my wife and I were at a show. It wasn't a mile. It wasn't a festival show. It was a different show at the Ben Keg one year and Kyle Magna was playing. And there was a guy in the middle of the room and he wanted to tell everybody in the world about his day, his, his work. <laughs> It just, it was not a good work day and he wanted everybody to know it. And he happened to find six people that he knew and he was 25 feet from the stage and we were trying to stand behind him to watch the show. And um, so if your, if your conversation is more important than the show or louder than the show, and you're trying to over talk the music, like at Gibson, we'll go over and we'll, we'll tap you on the shoulder and we'll just say, bring it down, you know, because it's not, it's not a quiet show. But it's a show we still want you to respect the artists. And that's that's a piece we have to keep cultivating Appleton because that is what they say, number one, is they're starting to talk now about the audiences. And there's something in the water. What do you guys have in the water here? Because we come here. We just want you to know, the artist just said this the other night, so I'll go verbatim. He said, we just want you to know that, that this, and then I think the, the, uh, the gal the next night, the artist said the exact same thing. But they said that this is not the norm everywhere. This is not what we're seeing when we're out on tour. When we come here, we feel validated. We feel accepted. We feel respected. And how cool is that? So I think the respected thing is huge. And the more that our music fans can share that with other people who think they're music fans, but they're really just, they're music fans, but they want music to be in the background. That's not what we're about. We're, as we've said from day one, we're a music first festival and we'll always be a music first festival. Wanted to say is as a teacher, I, I play the mile channel and play a lot of mile of music bands in my classroom while I'm, well, we have labs and different things like that. And one of the things that you have helped is my students being out in the community during mile of music and seeing me in the crowd and saying, Hey, Mr. Toshner. Yeah. You played this band in class or you were at this and, you know, I, I always tell them, I said, it's not the music you're going to hear on the radio, but you're going to see some incredible people who love what they do. And I said, that's the biggest thing. You, If you love what you do and you're, you're, you're going out there, you're going to be a very happy person. And I said, look at all these people. They're happy people up on that stage with the crowds that are around there. And, you know, you're, you're getting high school kids out at Mile of Music as well. And it's it's a fantastic thing. Yeah, well, that's well said. I mean, and that's a great perspective that I'll take um, uh, for my my future sharing with other people too. But it is that idea that um, you know students can can learn just from the just from the interact, and and I think that's part of it. That interaction is visible. It's it's palpable. Yeah. It's also very close to you like the fountain conversations. It's not you're not going to see this band, and then you're never going to talk to them. You're never going to. Never going to be able to text them. Are you never going to be able to um, to uh, you know Instagram them or Facebook them? That's what happens here. Is 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 it, connections are created for lifetimes right. with 
football. That's not all stuff that I, you know, when I, when I got back to the office with the idea in my head, it wasn't like I was thinking all those things, obviously, <laughs> you know, this is really going to be cool. Cause people are going to be, you know, um, I didn't know, I didn't necessarily think about experiences are really important if they can be life changing, even for a moment. Mm-hmm. And, um, I didn't think about the life changing beyond just the moment. Um, and, uh, that's that it gets you verklempt, it gets you excited. It gets you, it gets you, you know, all sappy, um, uh, thinking about it, but it really is the cool part. And, and I, I also know that with our student marketing team that we had for a number of years there, yep. they helped launch the, they worked on the festival those first years, they ran the bus schedule, they did all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I know that many of them are in marketing now. So on the marketing side, I know that we influence people, which was really cool. You can imagine on the music side, which is a lot, a lot more of a sexier thing than the marketing world. But, but um, I guess there's, there's, the, I guess you could probably poke holes at that, but um, they're, they're probably uh, marketing does stand pretty for what we do with marketing. The idea of fla- uh, substance over flash, the idea of giving something meaningful, over some, it, it really has been a remarkable journey. And I, and I do, um, every now and then it runs through my head about the number of people who've been impacted, the number of younger people who have been impacted. I think you shared, I, I appreciate that you are telling them it's more than just being able to play guitar and, and, and be up there. Play. It, it's about creating content and songs and, and, and being a creative, but then also how do you treat that fan when you see them after the show and, that's what makes it special. We have, we can count on one hand. Um, I'm definitely no more than two, but I think it's one hand. The number of jerks we've had at the festival within the music. Uh, there's been three, four thousand artists that have come to the festival over the ten years. Maybe, maybe five thousand, and um, they're just really good people and they would be the ones that would talk to that high school student after a show if the high school student went over and said hey you know what kind of what kind of guitar do you play and and, and why do it and that's that connection i guess is the word um is made at mile all those connections and i i you know i i think that it would be really cool at some point we do this a little bit at Gibson before some of the shows where we'll have Q and a about the festival and stuff, but I've talked about this, just having a gathering at the chapel sometime and have everybody come in and have a pass around microphone and have everybody talk about their connections they've made at the festival. I, I think, it would be amazing what we'd hear. Oh yeah. It'd be incredible. You know, Dave, you talk about like from a marketing student and and my son Cooper actually went through your, your, your marketing firm, you you know, program that you do it. It happened to be during the COVID year. So it was a little bit different, but you know, I look at it, the, the, the marketing it's, it's the mile of music. That whole thing was created out of marketing out, out of, but it's no different than an artist creating a song. It has a life. It evolves year over year. You talk about how miles evolving after year 10. I mean, it's, it's no different than a song. The artist plays a song and it changes a little bit over time. You know what they play this year isn't what they're going to play 10 years from now, even though it's the same song, same concept. And it's the same thing. And I think, you know, my son Cooper, oddly, we talk about that exact same thing that, you can take an event, an idea, and run with it, and it'll morph, and and that's just part of the journey. That's the fun part. I think, and, and I'll I'll try to keep it shorter. I'm, I know I'm giving much longer answers than I'm uh, really allowed to. I think the, <laughs> oh, no. yeah, there's a podcast protocol that probably says that there's this long, and then there's this long, and then it's like, okay, don't ever ask this guy back again. But <laughs> talking to some of the musicians early on in the festival, but then since then, over the ten years. Um, there's so many creative artists and so many good artists. And um, if they can't get to a certain level right away, that allows them to spend more time to financially to do what they're doing. It's always going to be kind of this additional thing, this hobby thing and so forth. And so it really is a situation where one of the pieces that they don't necessarily have access to is the marketing of it. So the blend of this, of, of having put artists together with the marketing side to create a brand that the brand stands for what they who they are original me- artists performing original music that's been kind of the magic of it that's been kind of well it's been probably the strategic secret sauce behind it um of of why it works is because it is it is very much that it's um 
it, it, t- it takes a few different components to be able to get in front of a lot of people and so forth. And um, again, uh, the community has been such a huge plus on all this that um, we can't uh, we can't thank the, the community enough. The different communities within the community, the sponsors, the in kind. I, I, I always say the, the the true secret sauce of this thing is is all the in kind support we get from so many key partners that people don't have any idea because we we certainly put their logos and everything, but they're 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 not the necessarily the financial driving force. But if you had to pay for everything that these folks give us to make the festival happen. The, the, the all the work that an EPS does that they don't charge us for, all the work that Willems Marketing Events does that we don't charge the festival for, all the work that Fast Signs does. And, the, and there's about 40 or 50 in-kind supporters that give us full in-kind, Star Patrol, which is our security, which they're just amazing. Um, I can go on and on and on. That piece of that part I learned from my years in town working on events. I knew that that generosity was there, but you had to know how to kind of approach it. You had to put something together that was important enough that they felt it was going to what their contribution would be game changing for the community. Um, we were able to do all that, and that now has become a, I, I refer to it as one of the buckets of the festival. There's financial buckets. There's the sponsorship we pulled together. There's the new nonprofit that now is recruiting donation dollars. There's the money we get during the week of the festival, specifically the four days of the festival by running Jones Park and Houdini. And that's concessions and merchandise and uh, and, and so forth. And then the um, last bucket is, is unfor- has unfortunately been like me and, and, and the firm and others short falling, whatever we come short. But the fifth bucket that was in there, the, the, and maybe the most important one, is this, this in-kind bucket, which is probably a million dollars of in-kind value out of our $2.5 million festival. Um, and so when other communities approach me, which we get pretty regularly, and say, hey, can you help us start a mile of music? Can we start something like it? Can we do our own festival? My answer is you can for sure. I know you can. The scale of it, how big it is is going to be based completely on the type of community you have, the makeup of your community, and whether you can pull some of those people together to support it. Um, and uh, um, the other piece that's changed, quite frankly, this, these days, 10 years later, is we had amazing support from the Post Crescent at the start of our festival. Um, they helped us launch the festival as it is, as it's known. Um, and there isn't really that one media outlet these days that has that kind of attention, right? And so it would be trickier to, to, to get something established that way. We were unfortunately moving along before the world of newspaper change and the media aspects of changing. Radio is not the same, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, we, timing wise, we, we hit it pretty well. I think we could have hit it better had I started it five or 10 years earlier. <laughs> been a little different and i probably wouldn't still um be um texting or um um, podcasting with you from home with my wife for the next (laughs) he would have moved on very quickly i think you know you you talk about morphine in the post crescent but i mean it's a real thing now right your 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 app is what i think is just world class and and I guess just the way you communicate with people through social media. I mean, that whole world has completely changed really in the, in the 10 years that that you started this, right? It has. And so, you know, fortunately we were established. And so then now it's just been kind of putting like some of the frosting on and so forth every year, we have to change the frosting, but the cupcakes kind of there. And and I think um, I'm glad you've mentioned the app because um, both our website provider, Stellar Blue and our app provider, um, which um, started out as, as known as Skyline Technologies, very prominent in downtown, great people. Um, they, um, they have really um, evolved for us one of the best apps, um, some of the best online presence between the app and the website and, and the blogging that we're doing and the, the social that Kim does. But, but, are, you know, really, that that the, the the effort that we're doing with the app is um, is world class. We there are festivals that have really redone their apps to be similar to ours. Uh, after the, the the very first year they did our app, I think it was the first year, maybe the second year, but I thought it was the first year. They won a, an award from from Microsoft because the you know at, at the at the World Conference in Montreal for the app that they did for us. I mean, 
and they and they do it in kind. So when we talk about in kind, and I see them all the time because they use Basil's as their conference room B, just like we do. And, and and Mark, by the way, Mark from Basil's, Mark Benke, who owns Basil's and owns a number of buildings down on, he's the one that gives us the band department that we can use for artists when they come into town. How, I mean, how cool oh, is that's that? awesome? Yeah. yeah. Or He's I, such a great guy. I said four different times, but I mean, but how cool is that? But that is each one is kind of as cool as the the next. But but um, so you look at this this community and what even just happens in Basil's and on the Basil's patio, the bat, the the Basio every year. The conversations we have. The, I ran into Melanie from from the, the app provider the other day, and and she was there, and and and, and we started talking a little bit about next year's app and and things. Um, it's um, it's it it really is um, the kind of thing that, and that's why I say too, um, when you look at the future and we look at where this is going, and there there'll be the there'll be the actual physical touching of live music with the festival and the other shows, but there's going to be a whole other component that'll be this opportunity to connect to the artists and to the music and to Kendall Street and to other be able to do that if they're interested through our portal to make sure that they have the, that we have that opportunity to make that happen. And with the idea that it can benefit the artists. And so um, we're, we're excited about where that can go. Um, and we just have to, uh, the, the honest um, being completely honest and forthright is the next six months, the next year, the next 18 months are going to be critical to how that gets done in terms of the, how we can create a financial model for it that just gets us over the hump. We're not this music industry, what we're doing. The only way you're going to be, it's going to ever be lucrative for someone is if, it, if they started it for the purpose of being that purpose of being lucrative to being a business, to making money. And when I have to explain to my business advisors, the people who I really appreciate that are great business people who've sold their businesses for millions of dollars in our advising and helping they struggle with the fact that I didn't start this as a business. I started it as a community thing that is having to learn how to be enough of a business that it can survive. Um, it's a passion project, but it's also more than that. It's a, it's a community. It's a community driven project that was developed to be here for the future. Um, and um, we just have to figure out how to make sure that that happens because it's a very popular thing. Yes. I explained this to the Rolling Stone editor when I talked to him and it was kind of off the record because that wasn't the angle of the story. But I said, cause they were saying, well, how does this possible? How do you do all this stuff? And it's, and, you, and it's a free festival because no one's doing it. And it's like, well, it's not easy. And it, it's not a guarantee that they'll be around forever under the current approach because we have been able to scrape and claw our way to getting it whole every year. Everybody gets paid. Everybody who hasn't been paid is our, our own firm and stuff. And that has made it difficult. So we're at the point now where it's like, okay, so how do we get this to the next level? And we got a lot of really cool people working on that. Um, but I want people who are listening to the podcast to know too, that we are working on it, but it's also going to take everybody's help, you know, in, in little ways and little ways in big, in big ways. We don't expect people who can't afford to support it, to support it. We want them to just come to the festival, enjoy it and support the downtown businesses, buy some food, buy their beverages. That's helping. Then the next level, okay, buy some merch while you're there. That helps us. Then the next level is, you know, maybe get the music maker badge and, the, and that really helps us. And the next level will be maybe you adopt an artist for the year and stuff like that. And so we're working on all that and, and everybody can stay tuned for where that goes next. But the potential as coming back to what you said earlier about Austin and Nashville and stuff, we do not, I think we would be wise to not think that we want to be Austin or we want to be Nashville. Or, um, they all do some amazing things. There's some things that aren't great. What we want to do is, is just be who we are, but also kind of become known as this oasis for original music from artists, again, who um, are not household names, but should be. And if we stay focused on that, and that that artist, that individual, that, that profile of an artist, um, I mean, in some ways, that's even cooler than jumping on a bandwagon of a big artist and a big name yeah. ever, because you're actually helping someone continue to create something, whether they ever become a big name or not. But maybe for the next 20 years, they're continuing to make music because of things like Appleton. And I can tell you, they certainly hold Appleton um, up as being one of the beacons that they're shooting for. That's great. I mean, we're 
Let, let's be their foundation, right? Let, let's be that support. How, how do you deal with mistakes and criticisms? I mean, what, what do you, you're sitting at home at night and you, you know, you got beat up for something that some arm, arm, armchair quarterback could do way better than you. Well, how do you deal with that? Yeah, not well. Um, but not, yeah. uh, um, <laughs> I think um, it's human nature to, to, to struggle with some of that. We've had our ups and downs with a few areas or since starting the festival. Um, the um, uh, Some of it comes from that trying to stick to the idea that we we need to be we need to do it for the right reasons we need to we started the festival there's 12 uh, mile makers uh, mile markers excuse me that we call them mile markers are the things that's the purpose for why we do the festival and and it's 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 sometimes hard to stay focused on those 12 things when you when you have to find a hundred thousand dollars to make sure everybody gets paid for the last festival um and um, and there's easy answers maybe there. It's like, well, gee, why don't we just start charging, you know, a hundred dollars for everybody to come to the festival? It's like, well, okay, hot, what it'll change things like I talked about before. So, um, I think, uh, the way you deal with it, I think for the most part, we have a team, a strong team that we can share and talk with to each other about, but I, I, I really do think it's, um, the we get so much um, love from the community. We get so many accolades from the community that um, you draw upon those. Um, I can draw upon our Gibson show Saturday, our Gibson shows Friday. And we just had Chris Gold's uh, toy drive on Saturday. You know, it's, it's what a cool event. I mean, just a, an awesome event, 80, 90, hundred people there over the course of the evening, bringing toys in the whole front area. So you draw upon the positives and all the great things that happen with around music and you, and, and I remind myself all the time, I say, I say, we got this obstacle to overcome, or we have this, we got to do, but wait a minute, but we have 10 years of a festival behind it that people enjoy and like, so let's focus on that. Let's, let's make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that this is being done for the right reasons. And I can tell you that I welcome anybody in the community who ever wants to talk to me, who thinks they know what the truth is about something or thinks they know that this happened or that happened. Do they think that they know? I think our biggest obstacle right now, for example, is I think people think we're making money hand over fist. They think that we're raking it in because it's such a popular festival, right? But that could not be further from the truth. We've invested and reinvested everything into it. So now whether that's smart, it's not. Whether it's a great business model, it's not. That's what it has been. But we'll change that. But the reality is just because one someone's sitting back thinking that we're doing that doesn't mean we are. And so I think it's important that people understand that the door is open. If they want to talk they can find me. I'm not really on Facebook, but I'm around. I'm at Gibson on a regular basis. You know, uh, go onto the website and type into info at Mile of Music and send me an email. Send us an email. Say, hey, this email's for Dave. Seriously. And if and, and I'll be happy to meet you for a cup of coffee. I've done this multiple times with people who have questions or concerns about something. Um, let's meet at, at one of the coffee shops downtown for a cup of coffee and talk about, and I'll take your, I'll take the questions because, um, when you're doing something for genuine reasons, when you're doing something for the right reasons, you don't really have anything to hide. And we certainly don't have anything to hide. So I'd be more than happy to have people come and, and talk to us. We've been very out, outspoken about the fact that we're going to need financial support. I think the best way I can describe it, and we'll go back is that, uh, to the sports analogy that we started out talking about sports and music. Um I think I and we as a, as a company and we as a team have taken the ball about as far as we can go with it. We've done about as everything we can do at the festival. We've shown what an amazing festival can look like. Mile five, mile seven, mile nine, they all get mile 10. They all got as everybody, as great as everybody thought mile 10 was mile nine, got the exact same scores on our survey after the festival. Mile seven got the exact same scores. I, I leave eight out of it. Cause that was a bit of an anomaly after the pandemic, but they've all gotten these amazing ratings and reviews and that's a testament to everybody who helps make the festival happen. So it's not just our team or not just me or whatever. It's the whole thing, but um, that's what we're shooting for. That is exactly what we're shooting for. And it's going to get continue to get done in different ways, but we're going to need the community's help. And we've taken the ball as far as we can probably go with it um, financially. And now it's going to be a matter of, let's see how we can make the next 10 years happen a little bit different. It's not, we're not talking about a crazy amount of money anyway. So it, it really is 
fine tuning things, getting it to step up to the next level, wanting to. Uh, the, the beauty of this too, guys, is we don't have to do a. It's not like we're sitting here going, "Gosh, to to be real a really good festival, we got to take it to here." Uh, it can stay right where it is yeah. with just some just some tweaks. Every year has to have different wrinkles. It has to look different every year. It has to be fresh in some ways, but. I think people love it the way it is. So we, it's not like we all of a sudden have to have go back to having 70 venues or 60 venues. We have 33 or 34 music venues. We have another six or seven venues for experiences. So like 40 venues. We don't have to change that. Um, somehow we've been very lucky and fortunate. We've been very careful. We've slow played the publicity. We couldn't say no to Rolling Stone, obviously. Um, but we've slow played the publicity. So my fear was always... You know, if we had twice as many people show up for the festival, now you've got lines out the door at two in the afternoon, not just at eight o'clock at night. And so somehow we've been able to get lucky at that. We've been able to keep the size of the festival almost the same, almost static. And and uh, there were more people there, I think, last year on Friday and Saturday. There were maybe a few less people on Thursday. And, there, and then Sunday's always such a crazy, weird wild card. You know, it's just never the same from year to year. So we think we're going to do some fresh stuff on Sunday. Some wrinkles are going to add a family component on Sunday to one of the stages uh, with original music, but it will be from family artists for the original music. We're going to, um, we're going to probably add some busking next year as you're making your way down the festival, you'll see artists performing. Um, and it comes back to what you alluded to before, which was, it really is a music in unexpected places. It's trying to create music in spots. The pop-up shows we did last year with bows in the, in the hotel were just, People loved them. I mean, we, yeah. it's always great to see that phenomenon where there's 11 people standing around Megan Slankard singing at the hotel. And by the time she's done, there's 110. I mean, <laughs> it's just such a great phenomenon to see. We want to do more of that for sure. Um, uh, we're going to probably take some of the vintage vans out, the, the VW buses. We're going to probably do some pop-ups pull up with the van band jumps out artist jumps out starts playing it's just going to be some cool stuff that that's going to add so you're not ever sure what you're going to see next some of the greatest experiences i've had at mile have just simply been walking down the sidewalk and some dude is strumming his guitar and people are around him you know things like that that that's just that's what to me you know that that's every bit of of mile and you know you, you talked about the app as well and i, I I wanted to just say one one more thing about that. That has become every bit about the experience for me is that app. I mean, it's it's one of my favorite parts of Mile is literally the week before Mile, I'll sit down on my back porch and I'll sit through that app and I'll just I'll plan out my shows. I want to catch these these these, and I never hold to that schedule, but at least it's it's a framework, and and I just so love that it's it's become a true part of the experience. It really has. No, there's no no question about it. And, and and we were right there at the beginning. I think we had one of the best apps early on. I mean, obviously there were other festivals that had apps before us, but we didn't have an app the first year. We did not have an app the first year. And so um and, and it was and, and to their credit, um I'm pretty sure at the time they were called Skyline Technology, but they approached us um to come and, and and do the app and 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 um they were excited because they were music fans and you know that goes a lot of times the tech folks are also you know music fans and so they were tech fans who were music fans and there was a basil's connection and they basically said we'd love to do your app uh it was john potasic if you know the name john potasic john is a is a is a huge music fan and he approached and said i think our team would like to do your app and um and uh, fortunately, I I, um, I knew what an app was. <laughs> I was still pretty old then, you know. It was ten years ago, but I was still pretty old. But I I knew what an app was, being in the marketing world. Um, and I said uh, I I didn't hesitate for a second. I said we would love that. Um, and then um, um, by the second year, we had it. And it, and had we not had one the second year. I guarantee you we would have had a lot of people coming out and saying, what the hell's wrong with you guys? You don't have an app? You know, that kind of thing. So it was just the timing was perfect. We we had an app by the second year. And not only did we have an app, it was pretty darn good to start with. I remember when we had John at the end of the second year, the song before we go on the stage at the chapel, we brought him over. And he, when he mentioned that he was with Skyline Technologies and they had done the app, the crowd went crazy. So, I mean, he was like, 
taken aback. I had a tear in my eye because I was so happy for him and so happy for the team there. Um, and they've met, and some of those same people are still working with us. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's a game changer. It was a game changer for us for sure. Um, but, um, there's so many of those types of folks, um, uh, dozens of the in-kind people that have helped to make the festival happen. And like I said, if you don't have those, we wouldn't, ha- I don't think we'd have a festival right now because how do you, how do you replace that million dollars of support? You just, you can't. Yeah. Um, Fast signs, doing all the banners, all the signage for us, which is critical for our sponsors and stuff. And to do that and to be such a great community partner, that's it's it's monumental. I don't know if that's special to our area or not, but I, I've yeah, there, there's so many great people in this area. Before we end and stuff, I just wanted to shout out your daughter too because she does an amazing job in the social media, and is an East grad too. So hey. Gotta shout her, <laughs> shout her out. <laughs> she thinks you're great too, and and she, you know, the amount of times we hear from our kids about how great the Appleton East teachers were, um, well, actually, no, that's never happened. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, uh, the, the amount of times we hear is just it's it's on a regular basis, and and it's been you know, what 12, 13 years since they've yeah. been, but it happens all the time, and it just so happens there's like, and I think it's true of the other high schools too. I just don't know them as well, but there's a core group of of teachers and, and educators at, at East that are also uh, mile fans and music fans that have kind of been on the journey with us. Cause you know, Kim was, Kim was a freshman in college when, um, was it freshman? No, sec, uh, second year in, uh, in college, sophomore, junior in college when we started it. And she ran the social from down in college and she did all, it was just, it was really neat. I remember we did the announcement of the festival that first year from the outer edge and she was at in, at Milwaukee, UW Milwaukee, doing running stuff down at UW Milwaukee. That was really when you think about it, she wasn't even there, but she was such a key part of things, and, and she had ever since. And so, um, and there's a lot of people like him that aren't my kids, aren't my daughter, that are doing similar things for the festival that have been supportive. Uh, festival, Gibson, other music venues locally, um, but. Um, yeah, I, I would say to to uh, to folks who are listening, in, uh, stay tuned because there's just some really cool stuff coming up. And and uh, you know, if you can help us, great. But help us just by supporting, saying good things, coming to the shows. That's all helping a lot and uh, making a big difference. And even just coming to Gibson for a show and paying the ten dollar or fifteen dollar admission, but to see an amazing show that makes a world of difference and helps us too. Gibson's is such a great place to see a show. I mean, Tash and I. I don't know if you're aware, Digstown does all the music for the Nusa cast. I mean, that was one of the very first things that we wanted was good music on the Nusa cast, even before sports was the music for, for us. One last question for you is just the events over you, you, you successful night. How, what, what's your nightcap? Like what, what, how, how do you unwind? What, what's the night, the night, the events, you know, over with how, how do you unwind? And then, then consequently what's the next day like you wake up the next morning what what do you feel what, what's that day like my wife just walked over she's in she goes, she goes don't tell them the truth no <laughs> we want the truth dave oh no it's actually what she was saying what she just said no what i was saying was you don't unwind so uh, <laughs> yeah that, but that's real i'm sure well well you know and, and it's not just me but i mean it, it, it is part of the nature of the beast um you're, you're kind of moving on to the next thing right away and so forth i do uh, i did just tell someone recently i said you know the thing i'm not good at even like with gibson with the shows and stuff i'm not good at living in the moment I'm not good at taking a step back and saying this okay okay that can wait let's enjoy this let's enjoy this moment um got to get better at that i think our, i'd like for our team to be able to have that experience better because they've put so much into it and it it really hasn't been fair to them over the journey that we've had to take such a tough stretch of, of trying to just scrape by and get everything done. So I really would like to get to the point where everybody benefits from this, the work that they've done. Um, we do, um, we do jump into the next thing right away. We always have stuff going on. Like there's always shows the next week at Gibson, there's shows and the next year we're, we're hoping to do some regular stuff throughout the summer besides just the Wednesday courtyard series that we do, which is an awesome series, but we hope to do yeah. some other things and potentially Houdini Plaza and, and, uh, and some other stuff. So, um, but, um, for me, um, it's going to sound really, really, um, like I'm making it up, but for me, the, the unwinding part is, is probably, um, 
just really being able to, to grab my notebook and, and go and, and hang out on the porch at Wooden Nickel uh, or go on the, uh, the patio behind Basil's and, and have a beverage and have, um, and have some, uh, some lunch and sit and, and just think about where this can go and what the, and brainstorm on the next event. And we're putting together a, the idea of a famous in Appleton festival, a, a spin-off festival that would be uh, really playing off of Jamie's famous in Appleton song. But the idea that all these artists feel like they're famous in Appleton and bringing those artists back, it's another way for us to have the artists who we can't bring back every year to the festival, have them come back and play another really cool thing. And so yeah. it's sitting down writing ideas like that, 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 that helps me unwind a little bit. It helps me um, kind of um, think about, you know, the good, the good aspects of what we've been able to create. Can I guess at one other moment that you may take in some enjoyment? And, and that would be, I, I always like just observing you at, at certain events and it, mile for sure. And there's always seems to be a moment where you're kind of always maybe in the background, but, but you sort of just sort of take in what, whatever it is, just somebody's set or, or whatever, but you sort of seem to take in that moment. Maybe it's only for five minutes, but is there moments like that where you do actually, that's sort of the high it's like, Oh yeah, we're, we're kind of pulling this off or, Maybe it's maybe it's one of those things where you're you're pumping your brain full of we can do ten of these things better in that moment. No, it is that for sure. No, there is some of that, and it does. And I, the last couple of years of the festival, trying to position myself a little more in a spot like at the hotel where I can float to multiple places. I can talk to artists. I can talk to fans. I can talk. I can glean information, but at the same time, I can take a moment. To, well, I say I take a moment to enjoy Megan Slanker's pop up, but then I ended up having to kind of block people off from coming through because they had to walk around. So, because other because Bose was filming, had a film crew in, they were filming, and otherwise they would have walked right in front of them. So I didn't end up working it, but uh, but it was working it in a good way. But sitting down in, in like the ballroom and watching Buffalo Rose performing, or sitting down um, uh, certainly at first songs um, and enjoy, you know, and, and so forth. But um, I try to get down. Usually try to get down to to Houdini Plaza and watch a, 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 I always try to catch snippets of shows, Lawrence Lawn this past year, because we're trying to evolve that into an even bigger and better location. Um, I didn't get a chance to get down to Emmett's or Spats to that end of the avenue at all this year to the festival. I mean, think about that. When you you guys know, know that you're trying to juggle everything and get to as much music as you can, and you think you stop back. Nancy Krieger, who heads up the, the Afton Community Music Board right now, the nonprofit, she says all the time, she says, you know, you're, you're at the festival and you think you're seeing a lot of it. Sorry. You think you're seeing a lot of it. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I'm at one show and there's four other shows going on right now. You know, it's at, impossible to see everything. On the <laughs> I'm at one show and I'm at the 513 and I'm having this amazing moment at the 513. Uh, so I, but I'm, but I'm still missing. I'm only to what is that 3% of the festival at that point. So um, I do try to do that, Joe. I try to get to spots. I try to pick and choose spots where I can go and hang out for maybe two or three songs and just really soak it in and enjoy it. Yeah, that's good to hear. No, it's uh, you, you need those moments. I think that's the fuel to, to keep you going. No doubt. For sure. No doubt at all. All right, NewsCast listeners, uh, here is that segment where we take a look at history. It's the old look at new. Uh, we try to pull stuff out that we find interesting, uh, whether it's in our own neck of the woods here in northeast Wisconsin or even across the nation or the entire world. So, Joe, what are you looking at for your look at history this week? Well, Tosh, it's, um, you know, weirdly, I don't know. We have Dave Willems on, and Dave, Dave's, I think, you know, we're roughly the same age. And he's, yeah, he just kind of reminisced where you were as a kid growing up. And I happened to be biking by just 
what was the old Austin's grocery store? And I think if you're probably shoot, I don't know how how long they've been gone, but you, you, you're probably anybody under the age of 40, maybe even 45 has no idea what I'm talking about. But there, there is actually still one or was still one up in, up in the original one up in Alloway um, that, that, that was been around for 68 years or so. I think it, it, it started in 1953. But in particular, I just... I just wanted to take a quick look, an old look at new. I don't have a lot of historical facts other than the fact that I remember these two Austins and I remember people that worked there. Uh, there was one on Richmond Street, um, right by where the old George Webb was, right across from the Black Bear. Um, and then there was another one on the south side where I really, really wish it was still there. Uh, right where that roundabout is when you're coming off the College Avenue Bridge uh, on the south side, turns into John Street and continues on to College Avenue and over to Newberry, uh, right there, just a block to the north on Newberry. Um, there was an Austin's right there. I think that'd still be kind of a cool place for a grocery store right now. I know I would use that. Uh, but yeah, those were Austin's. <laughs> so I don't know. Weird look at old look at new for me, but just kind of a shout out to that. Just a memory of, of a of a I have an old spot in eastern Wisconsin. So how about you, Tosh? What are, what are you looking at? Well, I'm going to go back and look at uh, sports history. I'm going to go back to December 11th, 1938. Uh, we're going to go all the way over to the Polo Grounds in yeah. New York. And um, during that time, that game, the New York Giants beat the Green Bay Packers 23-17 for the, uh, for the, the championship. Um, they had a record attendance of 48,120 people. Wow. That was the highest attended NFL, or it wasn't NFL at the, yeah, highest attended what game at the time. What year was that, did you say? I'm sorry. 1938. Wow. wow. Giants Packers for, that wasn't the Super Bowl, that was just called the, yeah. the well, champion. I mean, the Packers yeah. have, it's, it's hard to calculate, but I mean, the Packers have a lot of championships. I mean, you think about the, the 20s yeah. and the, you know, the 30s. I mean, the teams with Hudson and... and right. Um, I'm blanking on so many names through there, but there were some great, great Packers that played all through those years. They won championships. I just thought that was interesting to uh, to see all the way back in 1938. And I think the biggest thing for me was looking at yeah. the attendance. I mean, in 1938, 48,000 people at a game. That's pretty impressive. Think about how they got there. You know, their transportation to the game. How, how, do, how do you go? How yeah. do you transfer? It, what, I can't I'm trying to think. The Polo Grounds was that in Queens or where was that? Do you know in New York? What I can't remember I can't off the top either. of my head. Yeah, I wish I knew. Every once in a while, I think I've mentioned this other times. You know how you get things on your Facebook, and and one of the things that I get are like aerial photos of old, old historic fields. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously, the Polo Grounds comes. Polo oh, Grounds is massive. The, the, shape of that thing and the yeah the size absolutely. and yeah i mean there's some yeah. epic baseball games played there yeah it was a good one tasha i thought absolutely. i love stuff great look at old guy i love stuff yeah i'm glad that's why we do this segment right tosh things like this absolutely You've... so that was our old look at new hope you guys enjoyed it we'll continue to bring this to yes. you each week All right, Newscast listeners, uh, we have a special throwback for you this week. Uh, we're going to go and look at probably one of the all-time most incredible sports writers for the Green Bay Packers, and that is Lee Remmel. We had the special opportunity of having him at the Red Smith Sports Banquet in 2000. Uh, Lee was born in Shawano, uh, probably best known for his 62 years with the Green Bay Packers as a sports writer and later as a uh, team employee. Uh, he covered, get this, his first game in 1945 worked with every coach from Dan Devine to Curly Lambeau to even Mike McCarthy. Um, this is a stat that I think is incredible. He witnessed more than 100 Bear Packer games. It's incredible. 40 Super Bowls. A true legend, uh, a true Green Bay Packer, uh, if you want to call him a Packer, because he covered so much. Uh, just a great opportunity for you to Sit back, enjoy. We hope you uh, like this throwback. And if you do, remember, Sunday, the full throwback will come out on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to follow us on Facebook, X, Instagram, um, TikTok, 
subscribe and download wherever you get your casts and uh, check out that YouTube channel for those throwbacks. Red Smith Sports Awards. Banquet Throwback. The Red Smith Award, of course, goes to someone who has made some unique contributions to sport in Wisconsin and also epitomizes the great values that Red Smith exhibited. Ladies and gentlemen, the let's winner give a Red Smith of the Red Smith Award for the year 2000, Lee Rambo. Not bad for a guy from Shano. Uh, <laughs> not too bad to be a dinosaur either, I've discovered. Uh, thank you, Larry, for that uh, extremely kind introduction. Uh, you were right, it was worth two Super Bowl tickets. Unfortunately, they're on layaway until two, uh, January of 2002. <laughs> My profound appreciation to the Red Smith Committee, certainly for this prestigious honor. In the Fox River Valley, according to Chairman Mike Reese, it's the closest thing you can get to being canonized, even if you're Catholic. <laughs> there is one other I would like to thank this evening because the idea to present me with this honor originated with the late Danny Ornstein, the former general chairman of this banquet for many years. My thanks also in his memory to his my widow Marilyn and to his family. At this point, I had intended to mention my wife, a remarkable woman uh, who has been, been uh, encouraging me every step of the way for 51 years, but she didn't want me to do it, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but she is a truly remarkable woman, and I'm delighted that she's gone, but made the trip with me for 51 years. In all honesty, I'm a little amazed and to some extent humbled by receiving this coveted award because all I feel that I have done is work hard for 50 years or so at the one thing that I know how to do. As with many kids today, I developed a strong interest in sports early when I was growing up in Shawano. My father, my older brother, and I listened to, intently to Russ Winnie on the radio delivering his dramatic descriptions of Don Hudson's remarkable feats during the late 30s and early 40s, as well as those of the Clark Hinkle and Arnie Herber, and a little later on, of course, those of Tony Canadio with the Great Ghost of Gonzaga. I had been ill from the time I was 10 until a brain tumor was removed when I was 15, and although I cheated a little, I wasn't supposed to participate in strenuous physical activity at the time, and my childhood hopes of being another Hudson, which were triggered when I caught three touchdown passes for the seventh grade at Sacred Heart School, thus were thwarted. My, my frustration led to my becoming an omnivorous reader. I read everything that came my way, not, not only sports stories, but novels by W. Somerset, Mormon, Lewis Bromfield, even a book entitled, What a Young Girl Ought to Know, which, <laughs> which I found pretty interesting. Uh, 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 I, was, I was a teenager, and that was very interesting. But anyway, <laughs> that in turn led to my starting to write editorials for the Sacred Heart Parish newspaper in eighth grade and becoming sports editor of a weekly newspaper as a freshman. Near the end of my freshman year, the Green Bay Press Gazette hired me as a correspondent for Shawano and Shawano County, and I found myself covering virtually everything in the area very quickly, including two murders in, in a three-day span, a projected precedent-setting strike against the federal government by the Menominee Indian tribe, city government, sports, even weddings. Out of, out of high school in 1944, I was invited to join the Press Gazette staff and found my desk next to that of George Whitney Calhoun, the man who had called the very first meeting of the Packers team in 1919 and still functioned as the Packers' part-time publicity director. One day, he said, had said to me in the summer of 1945, Hey, kid, how would you like to write the Packer press guide? I said, What's there in it, Cal? He said, Ten bucks and two season tickets. I said, I'll take it. What I subsequently produced was hardly a literary masterpiece, but it did serve to whet my appetite for a closer association with the Packers. Accordingly, I went to the sports editor of the paper a little later on to, 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 to let him know that I know how to write sports. And I said, if I pay my own expenses to the game against the Detroit Lions in Milwaukee on Sunday, would he allow me to write the sidebars, interview the head coaches, and, 
and uh, write the notes, et cetera. Somebody else was covering the game itself. He gave me the green light, and I lucked out in a big and historic way. The Packers were trailing 7 to nothing early in the second quarter. Now listen to this. Don Hudson went on a rampage. He caught four touchdown passes, kicked five extra points, 29 points. It's to this day, the most points scored in one quarter of one game by one player in the history of the National Football League. The Packers went on to score 41 points, unanswered points in that quarter. To this day, they share the record for the most points ever scored in one quarter of one NFL game. And the Packers went on to win the game 57 to 21, and the 57 points they scored are the most points they've ever scored in a regular season game. So the next year I joined the Press Gazette Sports Department after proving that I could write sports and I was assigned as a second man in Packer coverage, a stroke of great good fortune for me. I spent the next 27 years on the sports desk before joining the Packers in 1974. Over those 54 years, I've had the opportunity, as Larry mentioned earlier, to work around all 12 head coaches the Packers have had and interview and write about literally hundreds of players. A memory of Vince Lombardi in February of 1959 taking over the Packers are totally obscure, obscure nationally, taking over the Packers with great conviction. He said at his first news conference at the old Hotel Northland, you will be proud of this football team because I will be proud of it. Another memory of Vince leaving for Washington 10 years later, February of 1969, I was happened to be privileged to be the only me member of the me Wisconsin Media Press Corps uh, at the airport as he left by private plane. He said it's been a great 10 years. Speaking for myself, in my two careers, it's been a great 50 years. Looking back, I wouldn't change a thing. Thank you. Tosh, it's forgotten, and I'm never forgetting. I think I've never forgotten it. Now I got it. But anyway, Tosh, in your world, it's forgotten, man. What do you put? Uh, what are you forgetting in this world these days? I'll tell you what. I this time of year, uh, we put a, a rink in our backyard. It's about thirty-five feet wide and about fifty, fifty-five uh, long. So it's it's a decent size. But I want to, you know, I always you, you, you take it down. And you're have the whole summer and you get to fall and you start putting it back up and holy crap, there's a lot of work that goes into putting that outdoor <laughs> rink in. And I just want to forget all of that work because it's a ton of work putting up the boards, putting it, screwing the boards in, putting the tarp in, putting up the lights, putting up the nets. It's a lot of work. It's a lot I of work. I can only imagine. Tosh, it's incredible that you do it. You've done it for so long. I mean, I'm, uh, you're a legend. You know, you will be. I mean, it's something that people literally will always talk about. It's it's really cool that you do that. I've said this before. Tosh definitely knows how to use his yards in all four seasons. He's, you know, humble brag. <laughs> he's got a fireplace in the backyard. You know, it's it's just it's it's beautiful. You know, it's it's he literally can use it uh, 365. So well done. <laughs> Excellent. Well, what do you got, Joe? What do you uh, for forgotten? Well, one thing I really want to forget. And I really want to almost drop kick the dang thing. It's my it's my computer. I'm so in need of a new computer. Um, you know, every once in a while, I'm sure it's obvious to people on that listen to the podcast. There's every once in a while weird scramble noises. Um, that's probably my computer. It's our uh, our producer and editor Taylor, as we've talked about him before, I mean he's totally awesome. Uh, it's not him; it's it's totally my computer. So I do apologize for that. I just, you know, it's been in my notes to just say that my computer needs to be forgotten. So eventually, here in the next few few weeks, here I'll get a new computer and life will be good. So in the meantime, I apologize, Tosh. That uh, <laughs> oh, sometimes I hate electronics. I don't know if I'm showing my age or not, but uh, yeah, I I hate electronics. But anyway, Tash, um, all of that is soon to be forgotten. How about uh, something? What do you never forget? Well, this ties in with my forgotten. I, I talk about all the work that goes in and filling all filling up the rink. But you know what I'm never forgetting is just the boys with their friends out on the rink in the right. middle of winter. It's 10 degrees out. They're cold. There's a wind chill. The lights are on, and they come in freezing. But 15 minutes later, they're back out there. And it's just it's those uh, those memories that you know I'm definitely not yeah. forgetting, never forgetting. Yeah, dude, for that's sure. that for real. That's that's so 
I mean, that that's that's actually awesome. I mean, not to, I don't know. Guys aren't supposed to get emotional sappy or whatever, but I mean, for real, that's exactly <laughs> right. Isn't that cool? I mean, that 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 you created a memory. I mean, you kids are going to remember that. Their, their friends are going to remember that. You know, it's like, hey, yeah, hopefully, well, they totally. Well, there's there's absolutely no doubt in the world they won't forget it. You know, and heck, you keep it going. It's always just there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, um, <laughs> yeah, that that's really really special. That's that's what it's all about. Hopefully we get a decent winter where I keep ice, yeah. unlike last winter. What are you, uh, Joe? What do you never Well, forget? Tash, similar to you having um, really creating memories, um, you know, creating events, I kind of had that it's sort of unexpectedly had, had one this afternoon, the day. It's, I've had a really good day today, Tash, with great recording. And, and this story here I'm about to tell is really all part of a great day, but... I got to hang with my daughter, Amelia. It was, she needed a new phone. I mean, she'd been a trooper. She had, like, I'm embarrassed to even say what kind of phone she had. Um, but a teenage girl needs, you know, you need that phone. So, you know, all the horror stories, just nothing more than I hate than walking into. I know there's many ways to get phones, but just I'm a little bit old school when it comes to, I just need to go talk to somebody in person and actually sit and physically do it. That's just me. Um, so that involves going to, you know, in our case, Verizon, and it can take forever. But we totally went in with the mindset that it was all going to be good, and it was. So they text you, and we ended up having an awesome afternoon. We wandered through Target. We had Starbucks. We had we had ice cream. We we had <laughs> we literally just sat in aisles and just shot the breeze and had father daughter time. And it was one of literally one of the best there afternoons I've had. You know, it was like two and a half three hours and and i was kind of conscious of it as we were going through it and you know she ended up getting a great phone the transfer all worked out great with data which is always a bit of a stressful time and uh you know it uh i don't know i'm never forgetting about it It was a really special father-daughter afternoon so i guess i wanted to share that in the i'm never forgetting segment tash excellent that's awesome and if you continue to like these segments remember Check out the uh, podcast anywhere you get it. Uh, check out YouTube and remember to subscribe, like, tell your friends. Do whatever you can to pass on the message of what you think of this podcast. Thank you for listening to another great episode of the NoosaCast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd hit up our social pages, subscribe, like, follow, and don't be afraid to engage. Head over to our YouTube channel to get exclusive content like the full interviews and speeches from past Red Smith banquets. Thanks for listening to the NoosaCast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and tell a friend. A huge thank you to Digstown for all the music in today's episode. Catch a gig or find them on Spotify. Help us grow by subscribing wherever you get your pods or sharing the NoosaCast. Follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. One of the best ways to help us grow is to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Northeastern Wisconsin Sports Advancement is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to raise money, provide support, and bring greater awareness for youth sports organizations in Northeast Wisconsin. We do this primarily through the Red Smith Sports Award Banquet and the NoosaCast. Each year, we give back to the community through three initiatives, the Every Kid Plays Grant, the Gives Back Initiative, and scholarships to student athletes. 